So I got this Jeep Compass today as a loaner car. And obviously my very first thought was, let's make a video with it. My second thought, which came shortly after, was who is this car really meant for? I think that a Jeep Compass would be an amazing first car or car for a pretty inexperienced younger driver. Now I don't mean that if you're older or that if you are very experienced and you like to have one of these that you shouldn't or that it's not suited for that. I just think that what it's really good at and where it shines is being a car as some, or being somebody's first car or being somebody's second, third car when they're in college, when they're pretty young and don't need something that's either too luxurious or too expensive. And I really think where this stands out from say a RAV4, a CRV or a Tiguan is its youthful appeal. So this is a 2021 Jeep Compass Limited and it starts at $31,000 in this all wheel drive form. And as equipped, it's $32,500, which is quite a lot, but there's good news. FCA is offering $3,500 off with a consumer cash incentive, as well as an additional $750 off for a Chrysler bonus cash incentive. So the true final price ends up being about $28,000 flat, which really isn't too bad for a brand new car, especially with all the tech that I'm just about to get into now. But I also want to say I would also spring for the elite exterior group, which includes 19 inch wheels with all season tires, Xenon headlights, LED tail lights, and a power lift gate all for only $1,500. And I think that really would wrap this car's kind of tech and convenient package up really nicely. Convenience package. So these all wheel drive models get a nine speed automatic, whereas the front wheel drive models get a six speed automatic. And all the models come with a 2.4 liter naturally aspirated four cylinder motor producing 180 horsepower and 175 pound feet of torque. Despite weighing less than 3,500 pounds, the Compass sprints to 60 at a quite dull pace, taking about 9.3 seconds to hit 60 and about 29 and a half seconds to hit 100 miles an hour. So uh, perfect for a young driver. Now I mentioned that this is a limited trim. And I also mentioned that this is a loaner car or a rental car that I've gotten. I'll take my car in for service. So it's listed as a 21 everywhere. The VIN verifies that, that it's a 21. It doesn't have many miles on it. But for some reason, the roof is all white, whereas on every other limited model I've seen, it's black. So I don't really know. I can't, I haven't been able to find an explanation for that. So I figured I'd kind of implore all the real Jeep enthusiasts that are watching to let me know if they know why or how the roof is white on this and how that makes sense for a 2021 model of your car. But yeah, just comment down below what you think. And now let's get to driving this Jeep Compass. So why would this be such a great car for a young or inexperienced driver? If it isn't already obvious, let me further explain. If you're looking for something reasonably priced, particularly to lease with a sporty Jeep identity that has a good amount of safety features, some tech, well, this checks all the boxes. It's smaller and easier to drive than a car like the Tiguan that kind of sometimes felt like a soccer mom mobile. This definitely has that smaller footprint and it's a bit more fun and sporty in that sense. It has a nice clean look up front. It actually looks pretty similar to the Grand Cherokee. You get the classic seven slot uh, Jeep grille. Out back, it looks a little bit more funky, especially up top, kind of near the C pillars. It reminds me a bit of the Volvo XC40 in that sense, but there's really cool Easter eggs sprinkled all over this car. For instance, you get a little military Jeep going up the side of the windshield. You get a lizard up on the front cowl by the wipers. You get a Willys grill imprint on your lift gate and a Loch Ness Monster on the back of the windshield. I'm sure that there's even more than that, but those are some of my favorite little Easter eggs that I was able to find just in my short uh, time with this car. So this Compass comes equipped, <laughs> it's crazy to say Compass, this Compass comes equipped with a rear view camera, although with a bit of a lackluster resolution when compared to like the Wrangler that has a fantastic uh, rear view camera resolution, but it does also come with blind spot detection, front collision warning, and even lane departure warning. So this particular limited trim car also happens to come with adaptive cruise control, something that I'm very unfamiliar with. No car that I've ever owned has had it. Uh, I used it a little bit on the 405 and it definitely works. And I think it's a very convenient feature for those who are commuting to either school or work and what have you, especially when you're in traffic. But for me, I still just like driving myself and it like scares me a bit. I wouldn't say it scares me. It makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. So the car drives decently well. It's certainly nothing to write home about, but I think most of its buyers will be satisfied with it, if you will. And the steering has a bit of nice weight to it, which is both something I simply prefer, but also something that adds a bit of an sporty element to the car. 
The steering wheel itself, actually, I mean, it's pretty nice and it's leather wrapped. It's just weird near your nine and three position. It's kind of weirdly shaped in the back and doesn't allow you to get a nice grip. It kind of feels like this to your hand versus letting you wrap your hand around it. So a little small complaint for me, but overall I really do like how the car drives aside from how lackluster the engine and the transmission are, which is because it's a low power NA motor in an SUV. So you're not gonna get that sporty feel at all when it comes to the motor, but the actual steering isn't terrible. Now, despite that lethargic powertrain, where this car really shines, it's four wheel drive capabilities. So the fact that you have these different modes, auto, snow, sand, mud, you can lock into four wheel drive mode because I think it goes between uh, front wheel drive and, and all wheel drive in order to save gas. I'm gonna see if I can get ahead of this Explorer. Oh, we're really revving her out. It's incredible to like rev a car to red line through two full gears and be only going 40 miles an hour and not be pushed back into your seat. It's like a revelation for me. So yeah, I mean, that's where this car really shines. It's that capability and almost sense of excitement it gives you knowing that you can kind of go off road or take the unbeaten path and it'd be perfect for either some exploring or for living in a climate that's a bit more diverse than a sunny socal here so visibility is not amazing uh, particularly towards the back of the side windows and out of the rear windshield although it's made up for by having a solid safety suite that i've mentioned and having a pretty small footprint uh, you wouldn't have an extremely difficult difficult time driving this car. I mean, again, it's a relatively small little crossover, but I definitely do notice that I don't get as much uh, horizontal, or excuse me, vertical viewing angle out of that rear windshield. Um, but again, at least you have the safety suite to aid you a bit. Now, rear seat legroom is pretty good, actually. I think sitting right behind myself, I was exceptionally comfortable considering, again, this is a pretty small SUV, but that middle seat, really is probably meant for either a smaller adult or a child to sit in the middle. It's a little bit cramped with how uh, narrow the car is. Trunk space is pretty solid. And again, up front here, the car is pretty comfortable. I mean, it's the seats, they actually look a little sporty than they are. The bolsters are pretty wide, so you can still move around quite a bit, but it's just, it's a pretty nice place to be. It's not necessarily an extremely cheap car either, so I'm not surprised that it is nice. It's a nice place to be. Well, there's nothing us young people like more than having our friends in the car. So. You know what time it is, it's time for the tall boy test. I hope this car can fit a good amount of tall cans in it, but uh, you guys can comment down below with your guesses. And without further ado, here's the tall boy test. Now, there are a few gimmicks I have to mention. They're not all bad, but they're all weird. The first one is the shifter. So I noticed the first time I got in this car, I accidentally didn't close the door fully. And I put the car into drive, and with the parking brake disengaged, the car would, was like effectively in park. Like I could rev it out as if it wasn't in gear, even though the gear lever was pulled back into drive. It's a nice safety feature that Jeep has implemented. Overall, adds a little bit of peace of mind. Typical Dodge Chrysler FCA fashion, it doesn't always work. Like sometimes I'll put the car in drive, open the door and it'll let me drive. Whereas I know most of the time in those German cars, when you do it, it'll always sell the car into park. So a little bit weird and finicky and gimmicky, but ultimately a good feature and uh, put into place for good reason. Okay, the second gimmick is far less serious, but when you're interacting with this touchscreen Uconnect system, which is an all right system, this particular one has Apple CarPlay, but it doesn't have navigation. It's still 8.4 inches, still pretty nice. Um, when you're interacting with it, there's the volume knob, and in the middle it has a power button. Usually, from what I'm accustomed to and what I guess my intuition tells me, you press that power button and it mutes the audio. In this car, pressing that button turns the entire system off, which is weird, until you realize there's a mute button a couple inches over, and then even further over, there's a screen off button. The weirdest part of it all, if not redundant and not intuitive, the screen off doesn't even turn the system off. It just turns the screen off and tells you can touch the screen to turn it back on. Mute just says music is muted and then power off turns the whole system off. None of it seems like it makes sense and none of it has a purpose. I don't understand why or how they did it like this and not just the way that everyone else does it. The last gimmick is the steering. So I already mentioned that it's actually nicely weighted and 
pretty pleasant to drive considering what this car is all about. But when you're driving slow or maneuvering, parking, whatever, as you turn the wheel, every certain amount of degrees, maybe every 40, 50 degrees, there are these weird notches you feel. And they're not like anything, they're not like a positive feedback. They're just like kind of disconcerting click or like notch you feel through the wheel. Very, very, very weird. Maybe it's the kind of thing that after some time you either would get used to or just kind of tune out. But for me, it's only made me feel weird every single time I've come to a stop or tried to park or been maneuvering at a slow pace. It does not feel good. And it's not the kind of sensation you really want through the steering wheel. You want to feel the road, not feel bumps and clicks through the, the steering rack. All in all though, the Compass would make for a great first or second car and beyond that as well. But where this car really will shine is in the hands of a less experienced driver who's looking to get safety and tech features that sometimes won't be found for double this car's MSRP in a German car. And doing it all with that Jeep spirit that's sure to put a smile on any driver's face. And I think that's what this car is all about. If you guys enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to Mac Mini for more videos every single week. And as always, this is Rio. Peace.